The Native Fish Conservation Program in Yellowstone preserves and restores native fish to maintain their important role in the ecology of the park and also to provide for unique sport fishing opportunities. So today I'd like to describe to you the work we're doing in Yellowstone on Yellowstone Lake, on conservation of fish in streams, including West Slope cutthroat trout and early Arctic grayling, Yellowstone cutthroat trout restoration in the Northern Range, and some discussions about angling in Yellowstone and prevention of aquatic invasive species. So on Yellowstone Lake, we've had a major effort to restore the ecosystem by suppressing non-native invasive lake trout and recovering the native cutthroat trout population there. Yellowstone cutthroat trout are the sole trout of Yellowstone Lake and evolved here after glacial recession with only one other fish species, a small minnow, long-nosed dace. So for thousands of years, the cutthroat uh, being the only uh, trout in Yellowstone Lake were an important food source for many um, avian and terrestrial species in this ecosystem. Yellowstone Lake is considered the largest high elevation lake in North America. It has a depth of nearly 400 feet. The average depth is about 140 feet and it has a surface area of 136 square miles. Of course, Yellowstone Lake also has unique geothermal re resources similar to the rest of the park, but largely out of sight on the bottom of Yellowstone Lake. So these resources influence the ecology of the lake and make it fairly productive for the fishes here. The problem occurred when historical introductions of non-native trout came to Yellowstone in the early 1900s. One significant introduction of non-native fish occurred in 1890 when lake trout, which are native to the Great Lakes and portions of Canada, were introduced to Lewis and Shoshone lakes in the upper Snake River. Lake trout were then discovered in Yellowstone Lake in 1994 for the first time and thought to have been uh, illegally introduced potentially by anglers who just wanted lake trout in the lake uh, for fishing. This was a problem because lake trout are highly predaceous species in other lakes of the western United States where they had been introduced. Um, they had decimated the native fishery of those large lakes. And so when lake trout were first discovered in Yellowstone Lake, it was very alarming for the Park Service. So why are lake trout a problem? They're a predatory species. They live only within Yellowstone Lake, and they do not use spawning streams the way cutthroat do in the spring to spawn. They are deep dwelling in the lake, and that means they're not accessible then to uh, avian and other terrestrial consumers because they're deep within the lake and can't be accessed. They're extremely long-lived by comparison to cutthroat trout, and they produce thousands of eggs in a given year. So the impact of the lake trout on our native cutthroat has been pretty significant. So lake trout, as shown on this graph by the red line, increased dramatically in abundance and biomass in the late 1990s through the late 2000s. At the same time, we witnessed dramatic declines in our native Yellowstone cutthroat trout in spawning streams and within the lake itself. The loss of the cutthroat trout affected several important um, consumer species in the ecosystem that depended on them for a food resource. This included black and grizzly bears, as shown in the top graph. Um, the cutthroat trout are the solid brown line in the top graph, and the dashed line is the use of spawning streams by grizzly bears. And the grizzly bear use uh, of spawning streams mirrored the decline of the cutthroat trout during that time. But in recent years has been increasing uh, with the 
uh, increases in cutthroat trout that we're starting to see within the lake. The middle graph are the osprey, which only eat fish. And osprey nests declined from about 60 nests on average in the year 2000 to now where we only see about one osprey nest per year around Yellowstone Lake. The bottom graph are uh, the abundance of eagles nests around Yellowstone Lake. The solid line are the numbers of nests. The dashed lines are the success of those nests, which reached a low around 2009 and 2010. Eagles rebounded though, uh, because they were able to use other food resources in the lake area, including scavenging on carcasses. And they've also switched to alternative prey, including trumpeter swan cygnets and common loons. So since 1995, after the lake trout were discovered in Yellowstone Lake, We've been conducting a gillnetting program to suppress the population and allow the cutthroat trout to recover. Each year, a large fleet of gillnetting vessels uh, gillnets lake trout from late May until mid-October. So we have large boats and crews working on Yellowstone Lake every year. These crews are using monofilament gill nets to net for lake trout. These gill nets are set beginning in late May when the ice comes off the lake until mid-October when uh, winter begins to set in on Yellowstone Lake. The nets are lifted from the lake with a hydraulic net lifter shown here. And then the fish are sorted from the net, picked from the nets by these crews. They work all, all year, all season long. The crew members come from pretty much all over the United States and uh, work with us on Yellowstone Lake. We also do telemetry of lake trout as shown here where we'll tag the fish with acoustic tags, these live fish that were netted and then they're released back to Yellowstone Lake where we can then track them and they can take us essentially to other congregations of fish. The dead lake trout are dumped back into Yellowstone Lake in deep areas of Yellowstone Lake. Each year we catch about 300,000 or more lake trout um, that are then returned to Yellowstone Lake to maintain the nutrients within no, the system. No more, no more fins, they got taken away. So we've been doing research to better understand the, the fate of the carcasses that end up dumped to the bottom of Yellowstone Lake, to better understand the, any impacts when we, we might be having on the, the nutrients within the lake. Over time, the gill netting program uh, progression has looked like this from the 1990s in the top left through 2019, the red color indicates the concentrations of gill nets set across Yellowstone Lake over time and the expansion um, in, in lake-wide and then in the intensity of the netting by the darker shades. In a given year, our nets now look like this, where they're set across Yellowstone Lake by these various boats that work out on the lake all summer long. Um, the nets are set in a serpentine pattern shown by the zigzag patterns of these lines. These are all net sets on Yellowstone Lake. And they're set in this way to improve the capture of the lake trout, which tend to follow the nets when they, when they encounter them. So beginning in about 2012 to 13, we really increased our effort, which is shown here on the y-axis, in 100 meters of net per night to a point where we were able to curtail further lake trout population growth. And then the amount of net that we set now, set now annually uh, is about 6,000 miles of gill net that is actually put in the lake and then retrieved to uh, kill lake trout. 
So when we were able to get enough effort out in the lake beginning about 2012 is when we began to um, put the lake trout population into significant decline. The black line here is the decline of adult age six plus lake trout, um, which we've reduced by more than 80% since 2012. The white line are the middle-aged lake trout, age three to five, which we've also caused to decline in recent years. What we still catch though are an abundance of age two, very young recruiting lake trout, which has been variable over years, but, but still, still fairly strong, and they represent a high proportion of our annual catch. So our age two lake trout continue to dominate the catch, and we're working on ways to to get this stopped. We're working on me methods to suppress lake trout in an integrated pest management approach where we can attack multiple life stages of the fish. We are working to suppress lake trout when they spawn in the fall by killing the embryos, the eggs that they release on their spawning areas um, in mid to late September. We know of about 14 uh, spawning areas that the lake trout use within the lake, which are shown by the cross-hatched polygons here. We also have suspected areas across the lake, which are in the gray shaded areas, but we haven't found eggs in those locations yet. We've located these areas by telemetry of the tagged lake trout um, uh, in the fall by tracking them to their spawning sites. We we're hopeful that um, suppression of the embryos on spawning sites can be an efficient way to suppress the population because the total area of the 14 verified spawning sites we know of is only 0.03% of the entire lake surface area. So if we're, we're able to suppress lake trout on these small lake areas, um, it could be highly beneficial then to try and net them as they're free swimming throughout the lake, you know, throughout the rest of the year. We began by just dumping the dead lake trout carcasses on top of these spawning sites to see if we could kill the eggs, and they do. The decomposition of the, the uh, rotting lake trout carcasses quite quickly removes all the dissolved oxygen from the water and then quickly kills the embryos on, this, on these sites. We've also ground the lake trout carcasses. So this is all ground lake trout material here drifting down to the bottom of the lake. And it turns out it doesn't take that great high of coverage of lake trout carcass material to cause a pretty high mortality of the embryos on these spawning sites. Our problem is that we run out of lake trout carcasses in the fall um, because our netting program is shutting down for the season. So we needed an alternative um, organic material to use to treat sites in the fall and we, be, we developed these organic pellets which are essentially soy and wheat gluten material and they sink rapidly to the bottom of the lake. So we've been conducting uh, treatments of spawning areas in Yellowstone Lake with these organic pellets made of soy and wheat gluten. On the upper left is a cedar spreader, uh, which is completely full of the organic pellets. The cedar spreader is slung below a heavy helicopter, and the helicopter is then used to apply the pellets to the spawning sites out on Yellowstone Lake. The center image uh, is the organic pellets after treatment, uh, immediately after treatment, and the coverage that we've been able to achieve to cause the organic decomposition and the mortality of the lake trout embryos on that site. So in just within part of the day, we can use a heavy helicopter to um, apply the pellets to a primary spawning site in the west dome of Yellowstone Lake called Carrington Island. And the cedar spreader is shown here below the helicopter. The helicopter uh, prop draft actually forces the pellets down to the surface of the lake and, and towards the bottom, which is highly beneficial. 
to keep the material on the spawning sites rather than having it drift. So Carrington Island was completely treated with organic pellets both in October of 2019 and 2020. We set fry traps on the Carrington Island spawning reef in the springs of 2020 and 2021. And we only caught one fry out of nearly 200 trap nights of trapping for fry each of those years. And so we have evidence, really strong evidence that our organic pellet treatments of this spawning area essentially completely eliminates uh, recruitment from this primary spawning area on Yellowstone Lake. And this, you know, elimination of recruitment will um, help with the continued decline of the lakewide population. And we think that this kind of treatment of spawning areas could be beneficial in other sites around Yellowstone Lake in the future. What about our cutthroat trout? And how are they recovering in the Yellowstone Lake ecosystem? Up on the top right, this is the abundance of juvenile cutthroat trout from 2011 through 2020, and they are steadily increasing over time in this in the Yellowstone Lake ecosystem, which we're very happy to see. Our large cutthroat trout shown here on the upper left, the white boxes here, which are increasing from the 1980s through this past decade is the individual weights of the large cutthroat trout. Now, when you catch an 18 to 20 inch cutthroat trout in Yellowstone Lake, it weighs on average twice as much as an 18 to 20 inch cutthroat trout did prior to the lake trout invasion. So although the abundance of cutthroat trout overall isn't where we want it to be to meet our recovery goals, the quality of the angling is actually quite high because of the quality and the size of the fish that you catch. These fish migrate long distances in the backcountry of Yellowstone and in the uh, Bridger Teton wilderness of Wyoming as they migrate up the upper Yellowstone River to spawn. We have made trips into the backcountry to find these fish during the spawning period. Fish, 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 fish. Ah. You got him, Boy, just wants to run up So this is in early July okay. of 2019. Boy, she's a little, oh, rough life. You escaped lake trout for... For yeah. five yeah. years to be harassed up here in uh, Yellowstone Meadows. I grab a so the cutthroat trout migrate long distances Boy, back into the thoroughfare region the of the Upper Yellowstone River. Working hard, trying to make babies. Atlantic Creek yep. is where they are here. Come on, Mama, you got, you got some fight. <laughs> The bottom line is that the lake trout suppression program on Yellowstone Lake has resulted in the return of large migratory cutthroat trout to the upper Yellowstone River backcountry. There are other emerging threats to Yellowstone Lake. We recently discovered a cisco, not native anywhere in the West, during routine gill netting operations in August of 2019. The fish we caught was an age three female and otolith microchemistry analysis indicated that this fish was actually born in Yellowstone Lake, meaning that it has parents and probably thousands of siblings within the lake. Cisco are preferred prey of non-native lake trout and they are also would be a direct competitor to our native cutthroat trout for the same food resources. We are monitoring for Cisco using netting, and also we're examining the stomachs of our netted lake trout to see if we can find more of these fish within the lake. There's no doubt that if the Cisco population expands and becomes very abundant in the lake, it'll be at the cost of our native cutthroat trout because they 
rely on the same food resources. We've also recently found microplastics within Yellowstone Lake. Microplastics are small plastic particles, less than five millimeters in size, usually filamentous. And we found microplastics within the lake water column. We also found microplastics within three trophic levels within the lake, indicating that microplastics are being consumed by the organisms within the lake. These included amphipods, which are small crustacean species that are heavily preyed upon by cutthroat trout and lake trout. We found them within cutthroat trout stomachs, and we found them also within lake trout stomachs. The impacts of microplastics on the food web of Yellowstone Lake are unknown, but we intend to conduct further research to better understand this problem. So to summarize for Yellowstone Lake, since 2012, lake trout have been harvested at a rate greater than anywhere else on earth. More than 4 million lake trout have been killed since the program began in 1995. Adult lake trout have been reduced by more than 80%. However, recruitment of age two fish remains strong. Treatments off spawning sites may help to reduce this recruitment. The cutthroat trout are showing strong signs of recovery, but other components of the food web have yet to respond. Outside of Yellowstone Lake, we've been completing several projects to restore not only Yellowstone cutthroat trout in the northern range as shown here, but also other important native fish species, West Slope cutthroat trout and Arctic grayling, um, native to the Gallatin and Madison drainages in the western region of the park. Threats to these populations are also non-native fish. Hybridizing rainbow trout especially have caused major losses of native cutthroat trout uh, across the park. Competition by brown trout and brook trout are also problems in these areas. Our approach is to create headwater refuges for native fish in pristine areas where they can persist long-term. We create headwater refuges for native fish by using either an existing natural features such as the waterfall, Little Gibbon Falls on the Upper Gibbon River. In some cases, we'll modify existing waterfalls such as on Grayling Creek in the lower right or Sotheby's Creek Icebox Canyon in the upper center. Or in other places, we'll create new structures out of concrete such as in the Sloop Creek Canyon in the lower left or the East Fork Specimen Creek Barrier, which is a log constructed barrier on the upper left. The only way to completely remove the non-native fish from these restoration areas is to use an approved piscicide called rotenone. Rotenone treatments occur to remove all hybridized and non-native fish from these regions uh, above these barriers to make the habitat suitable then for the reintroduction of the native species. We have reintroduced native fish typically as gametes using remote site incubators, which are these uh, essentially five gallon buckets here where the embryos are placed um, in arrays as shown here on Grayling Creek, um, and then left where they can hatch and emerge into the stream and hopefully imprint on that stream to return later as adults to spawn. We have done several reintroductions also though as juveniles or adult fish using helicopters or other means to get them restocked into some park waters. So these are large in-stream remote site incubators used for grayling, Arctic grayling up in the South Fork of Grayling Creek. Essentially you create flow through these incubators so when the eggs hatch they can emerge um, with that flow back out into the stream. And here these are our Arctic grayling fry that have emerged from the re remote site incubators in the south fork of Grayling Creek.
these projects to restore Arctic grayling, West Slope cutthroat trout, or Yellowstone cutthroat trout to these backcountry areas are large, require interagency uh, collaboration to get done. Um, here in Grayling Creek and in the Upper Gibbon River, for example, we have staff from the Park Service, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Turner Enterprises, the Gallup National Forest, and Yellowstone Forever. We also work very closely with Wyoming Game and Fish Department on these projects. So our major projects in recent years have been to restore West Slope cutthroat trout to the East Fork Specimen Creek, Grayling and West Slope cutthroat to Grayling Creek, and Grayling and West Slope cutthroat to the Upper Given River above the Virginia Cascades. We've also learned about the dispersal of some of our native fish downstream, both grayling and west slope cutthroat trout. As shown here is this example of a grayling caught in the grayling arm of the Hepkin Reservoir downstream of Grayling Creek. Our Yellowstone cutthroat trout, stone cutthroat trout conservation efforts are mostly focused in the northern range of the park especially in the Lamar River drainage, we're working hard to preserve our native uh, large river, Lamar River cutthroat. Overall, we've restored 80 miles of streams to native fish in recent years and over 280 lake acres, most of the lake acreage being Grieve and Wolf lakes in the Upper Gibbon River. We've stocked um, 2,000 Yellowstone cutthroat trout gametes, over 95,000 West Slope cutthroat trout gametes, and 150,000 grayling. Similarly, we've stocked thousands of cutthroat trout and grayling um, as fish. In the future, we intend to focus our restoration efforts on the Buffalo Fork of Slough Creek. In the northern range, we've been conducting selective removals of rainbow trout and hybrid trout by electrofishing, um, but also by collaboration with fly fishing volunteers and interested anglers in uh, the conservation of cutthroat in this region. The Lamar River and Slough Creek are important cutthroat trout strongholds that we're working hard to maintain. The electrofishing removals of rainbow are preserving the cutthroat trout. A barrier on Lower Slough Creek is preventing future rainbow invasion of the Upper Slough Creek Meadows. But also, wranglers also play a big role in preserving our cutthroat trout because each trout in the Lamar is caught and released an average of five times per year. That means that anglers can effectively remove rainbow trout and hybrids from this system. We've conducted trout tracking, telemetry of trout throughout the Lamar, especially during spring spawning period, when all the hybrids and rainbow trout congregate down in the lower Lamar River, lower Slough Creek, and lower Buffalo Creek area of the watershed. We've learned that Buffalo Creek is a primary source of rainbow trout hybridization to the Lamar River system itself. The colors of the circles on this map represent the genetic integrity of the cutthroat trout in the Lamar River system. The lighter yellow colors represent areas of the Lamar where there remain uh, pure Yellowstone cutthroat trout, which is most of the uh, entire upper Lamar River system. The orange or light red colors represent hybridized fish cutthroat trout that have interbred with non-native rainbow trout. The dark red circles represent areas where there are actually pure rainbow trout in this system, which is primarily the upper Buffalo Creek watershed uh, north of the park boundary. 
The Buffalo Creek Project is a priority for preservation of the Lamar River cutthroat trout. Finally, a few notes about angling overall in Yellowstone, where typically over 40,000 anglers visit the park each year. In terms of where do people go, what waters are used mostly, um, you can see in this pie chart, Yellowstone Lake is used about 20% by 20% of the anglers that come to the park. Um, it's the highest use of any park water. But the Madison River, the Firehole River are also highly used along with the Lamar River, Slough Creek, Yellowstone River, the Gibbon River, and Soda Butte Creek. 19% of all angler use then occurs at other smaller waters across the entire park. Native species are a majority of the catch by visiting anglers to the park, including cutthroat trout, which recently 62% of anglers um, were catching cutthroat trout. Other highly caught species are rainbow trout at 11%, brown trout at 11%, brook at 7, 6%, and then whitefish and grayling. The data that I just presented to you was acquired from angler report cards, which we receive from anglers fishing in Yellowstone National Park every year. On these report cards, you can report the species of fish you caught, the sizes of the fish you caught, how many days you fished on that particular water body, and for how many hours. And for many of the park's waters, this information we receive from anglers is really the only information we have for many of the park's fisheries because there's simply too many of, the, of these waters for us to get to regularly as biologists to assess the populations. So this information we receive from anglers in the Yellowstone Park every year is incredibly important to us as biologists and managers in the park. Now the mail-in hard copy cards are still available in 2022, um, but we are also moving to an online system of data collection. So you will find on your Yellowstone National Park fishing permit and also on our park websites, a QR code which can be scanned with your cell phone, which will take you to a data entry form online, where then you can just electronically record your catch information. So here's another example of, how, example of how important the angler report uh, information is for us as biologists in the park, and this would be for angling trends on Yellowstone Lake. So since 1978, we've been collecting uh, this report card information, this catch information from anglers that uh, fish Yellowstone Lake, and you can see the catch per hour uh, early you know, in the 1980s, early 1990s, was nearly two fish per hour. But then you'll see from 1998 through 2006, a period where angler catch rates declined, and that's due to the invasion of Yellowstone Lake by lake trout. But then after that, it stabilized at nearly one fish per hour. But this is just another example, and this is a critical data set for us in assessing cutthroat trout status within Yellowstone Lake. Um, particularly related to lake trout and lake trout suppression going forward. Now, even though uh, even though the catch rates have declined and, and still are near one fish per hour, one thing to, to uh, keep in mind with this is through our report card information that anglers have submitted, we know those fish now that are being caught are nearly twice as heavy <laughs> as the fish that were caught prior to the lake trout invasion. So I'd like to talk just a little bit about our parkwide angling regulations. So every year we assess our fishing regulations in Yellowstone, and our goal is to make sure they align with our native fish conservation activities throughout the park. So 
So on the Yellowstone River downstream of Yellowstone Lake, so downstream of Fishing Bridge, and that reach that extends from there to uh, the Hayden Valley, the Yellowstone River fishing season has always opened on July 15th, and that was to protect our spawning cutthroat trout in that river reach, and also the gametes that would be in the reds uh, after the spawning has ended each year. Well, over the past two decades, we've documented a shift in the cutthroat trout spawn timing in this reach of the river. They're spawning much, much earlier than they did historically. And so that's now allowing us to change the opening date on the Yellowstone River in this area to July 1. So again, previously the river reach here opened on the 15th to protect cutthroat trout and their gametes. Due to the shift in spawn timing, uh, we can now open the river on July 1st, and so that'll, that'll occur now this summer in 2022. Another change you will see in the fishing regulations for the park this year is that we have a must kill regulation for all smallmouth bass that may be caught in Yellowstone Park waters. Because on February 19th of this winter, the Montana angler caught a smallmouth bass from the confluence of the Gardner River with the Yellowstone River. Now smallmouth bass have been in the lower Yellowstone River downstream of Billings for over 30 years, but in recent times, anglers and biologists have reported higher numbers of them upstream of Billings, near Laurel, and Big Timber in Montana. This is a concern because smallmouth bass are an advanced and highly prolific predatory fish species, and in locations elsewhere across North America where they've been introduced, they've caused severe losses of native fish populations. Our best defense against smallmouth bass in Yellowstone is to, first off, make sure they don't get to the park boundary to begin with. <laughs> but if they do, every fish that is caught in Yellowstone going forward in the future needs to be removed from that, that stream or, or lake if they invade a lake. And any fish caught needs to be reported to us NPS biologists. So within the fishing regulations booklet for Yellowstone National Park, you will find information on how to identify smallmouth bass. Smallmouth bass are a member of the sunfish family of fishes, which are definitely not native to the park. They have hard spines on the front of their dorsal fin. So this will be the only species in Yellowstone that has hard spines. They're incredibly aggressive predators they feed not only on trout within the waters they're within, but also on animals along the surface of the waters. So these smallmouth bass will feed, feed upon frogs, snakes, and even ducklings if they get the chance. And they're definitely a species that we do not want to persist in Yellowstone National Park. So any fish, any smallmouth bass that's caught needs to be reported immediately to us as NPS biologists. Lastly, I'd like to talk about our Aquatic Invasive Species Prevention Program in Yellowstone. Aquatic invasive species are a continuous threat to Yellowstone's waters, um, and they will be far into the future. Um, we have existing species in the park, of course, lake trout that we just talked about today, whirling disease, New Zealand mud snails. We have existing species in the park that we need to keep from moving from one water body to another by keeping gear clean as you fish in one area and then move to another. You don't wanna be moving these species with you. There are also multitudes of threatening aquatic invasive species advancing westward across the, uh, the United States and threatening Yellowstone. These would include, of course, drysinid mussels, zebra mussels and quagga mussels, which devastate uh, ecosystems and would be a, a, a significant problem for Yellowstone Lake or anywhere in the park if they were introduced. Other species can be equally invasive and a problem though. For example, curly leaf pondweed as shown here 
completely chokes out small bays and marina areas if it's introduced and is very difficult to remove once it gets into the system. Species like Asian carp, which are uh, causing raising havoc in the upper Mississippi River system, probably could easily find a place to live in Yellowstone if they were introduced here, as can be many other um, non-native species if they're brought here. The only way uh, to maintain Yellowstone is to make sure these species don't get introduced in the first place, because once they're introduced, they're almost impossible to then eliminate. This is the origin of watercraft coming to Montana in a given year. And so it just highlights the importance of uh, keeping clean watercraft because they're coming from basically every state in the country, including Hawaii. And they can be carrying species from all these locations right here to the Yellowstone Park. So watercraft inspections are mandatory prior to launching in Yellowstone National Park. Watercraft inspections are provided by our resource management staff in Yellowstone. Um, and when you arrive and, and purchase a permit to go boating in Yellowstone Park, you'll then be asked for an inspection and put through an inspection process. Each year, about 4,000 watercraft or so are inspected in the park, of which about 900 or so are actually motorized vessels. If a vessel arrives in the park and is dirty and may contain aquatic invasive species, it will undergo a full de decontam decontamination by hot, high pressure water. Funding for the projects that I've described today are National Park Service dollars, including funding that comes in from the sale of fishing permits. But also a large part of the program is supported by our fundraising partner, Yellowstone Forever. Just wanna thank you for listening to the presentation today. Everything that I presented is, is, is done by a large group of individuals that work in Yellowstone each year. Um, these folks come from all across the country and uh, are very committed to Yellowstone's aquatic resources. And so as a group, we want to thank you for all of your support.